Let's talk about the biblical foundations of work. The first time I needed a biblical foundation for my work was the year I worked at a racist gas station. I was in the 12th grade. Gas was 57.9 a gallon. If you came to our gas station white, you got full service. We washed your windshield, checked your oil, offered you the restroom key. We called you sir or ma'am. If you came to our gas station black, we pumped your gas. That's it. No windshield, no oil, no restroom key, no sir or ma'am. I felt terrible about that. I knew enough of the biblical foundations of work to know that treating black people badly was wrong. But I needed the money, so I didn't quit. The only thing I did was that I personally treated black people the same as white people. So if I happened to be on duty when you came in, I washed your windshield, I checked your oil, I offered you the restroom key, I called you sir or ma'am. But that is all that I did about racism in my workplace. Looking back, I wish I'd done more. I knew the Bible was supposed to be my guide to all of life. But there seemed a huge gap between this two or three thousand year old religious book and the realities of life I experienced pumping gas. I wish someone had known how to help me find the parts of the Bible that could help me in my workplace. For example, 1 Samuel chapter 25 could have helped me at the gas station. In this chapter, David is not yet the king of Israel, but he already has an army. So he visits a landowner named Nabal and tells him he'd like him to donate a flock of lambs to feed David's army. Nabal is a hothead. He gets angry about it. He refuses to donate the lambs, and he insults David in front of his troops. David's a hothead, too, and his response <laughs> is to order his uh, soldiers to, to 400 of his soldiers to go and slay Nabal and all the males in Nabal's clan. David is about to commit a kind of mini genocide that seems like an extreme version of the racism I saw at the gas station. Here's where it gets interesting. Nabal's wife, Abigail, rushes out to meet David, and she brings her own feast for his army. Then she gives what is probably the most polite speech in the entire Bible. Eventually, she gets to the punchline. The Lord restrain you from blood guilt and from taking vengeance with your own hand, so that you shall have no pangs of conscience for having shed blood without a cause. A hard message wrapped in a respectful speech. After David hears this speech, he changes his mind and calls off the attack. In other words, Abigail brings David a present, speaks to him respectfully yet forcefully, and he changes his mind. I could have done that at the gas station. Every day, I was bringing the owner a present. I was one of only two employees who didn't steal money from the cash register. <laughs> the owner knew that, and he valued it. And that's why I made eight cents an hour more than the other employees. <laughs> so some night when I was taking the cash register, uh, the cash bag, to the owner, I could have said something like this. John, if you're wondering why the cash in my cash bag always matches the total on the register tape, it's the same reason I always treat black people with respect at the pumps. The reason I respect you and your money is because it's in my heart to respect everyone. If you ever wanted a gas station where every employee treats you and your money with respect, maybe you should create an environment where every employee treats all your customers with respect. Just an idea. Have a good night, and I'll see you in the morning. <laughs> it never occurred to me to say anything like that. But if I had done as Abigail did, I know now that John would have at least listened. I'm sure I wouldn't have gotten fired or, or even yelled at. But it never occurred to me that I could talk to my boss about an ethical issue 
And it never occurred to me that God would be with me if I did. The Bible is a powerful resource for applying faith to work if you know where to look and how to apply it. Since 2007, I've had the privilege of working with the Theology of Work Project with a mission to research and write about what the Bible says about work. Of course, we are not the first to apply the Bible to work. Luther, Calvin, and Wesley famously paid attention to work in the scripture. And before our project began, there were some great books about faith and work, and now there are even more. But the Theology of Work Project was formed to approach this mission in two unique ways. One is to cover the entire Bible. As far as we can discover, this is the first attempt ever to cover what the whole Bible says about work. And the second is to include as wide a breadth of the Christian community as possible. We wanted to include people from across the historic Orthodox spectrum of the Christian faith. We wanted the skills of Bible scholars, theologians, management and other professional disciplines, scholars, theologians, pastors, and actual workplace Christians. We hope that this breadth would help us understand the scripture more fully, make more realistic applications, and reduce the danger of individual bias. So how have we done so far? First, we did succeed in creating a commentary covering all 66 books of the Bible as they apply to work, workers, and workplaces. On June 12th of this year, we completed the Theology of Work Bible Commentary online, and it's available free of charge for any non-commercial purpose at www.theologyofwork.org. And in your bag is a bookmark giving that address. I hope you'll find plenty of uses for it. <laughs> As of today, we are also releasing a print version of the commentary for people who like physical books. Ultimately, it will be a five-volume commentary. This is the first volume, Gospel and Acts, and it goes on sale for the first time today, right here in our book area, and also on CBD and Amazon and all the usual places you buy books. Our publisher, Hendrickson, is hosting a wine and cheese reception after the final speaker tonight, so please stick around and celebrate with us. <laughs> I would feel more guilty about making this commercial, except you don't have to buy anything. It's all right there online, free of charge, too. Along the way, we were amazed how much the Bible says about work. We found 859 passages of scripture that relate to work in some specific way. Before we started, I would have guessed 50 or 60 passages, not 859. That's because I thought the Bible was a book about religion that had some applications to work. But it's not. The Bible is a book about God. And it turns out that God shows up where God's people spend their time, which is mostly at work. All of us here know some biblical passages, 50 or 60 or whatever, that apply to work. But do you realize that these are not isolated highlights? They are representative samples of the whole Bible. To put it in biblical words, the cattle on a thousand hills are mine, says the Lord not just the temple on the hill of Zion. Once I took off my church polarized lenses, I began to see how much of the Bible relates to work. Now it's impossible to summarize 859 passages in three universal bullet points. So I don't have an easy to remember guide about what the Bible says about work. My message is not, we read the Bible so you don't have to. <laughs> My message is, if you want to know about work, read the Bible. We hope the TOW Bible Commentary can help. We've provided all kinds of navigation aids to help users find relevant materials, including tags, free text search, and overview articles where we bring all the material on particular topics together from around the Bible. Uh, so instead of universal bullet points, may I tell you three of my favorite passages of scripture from this project? In the book of Ruth, a business owner named Boaz figures out how to make a profit while fulfilling his duty to improve life for an immigrant woman named Ruth and for other vulnerable workers. That is literally a topic off the pages of the Wall Street Journal 3,000 years later. 
The Song of Songs is probably not the first book you go to for help on applying the, the Bible to work. <laughs> I mean, isn't it basically an erotic love poem? But read it closely. What are the couple doing while they recite love poetry to each other? They're planting a vineyard, and they're working hard at it. In other words, the Song of Songs is about a couple who start a small business as a way to make a living and also to strengthen their love for each other. Their work draws them together. It doesn't push them apart. I love this passage because it shows work and family not as a balance of competing interests, but as an integrated way for a couple to achieve what's most important to life as God gives it to them. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul and his church wrestle together with how to be true to Christ while working in a pluralistic society. 2,000 years later, we face the same challenge. The things that happen to God's people as they work in the Bible are the same things that happen to God's people as they work today. How did we do on our second goal, including as wide a breadth of perspectives as possible? So far, the Theology of Work project has included contributions from 138 people from 23 countries on five continents, and about 100 different organizations have been represented. I'd say we've done a good job of diversity with four shortcomings. Not enough women, not enough workplace Christians, not enough Catholics and other Christian traditions, and no contributions from Latin America. As I look around, I have a feeling these are challenges for the entire faith and work movement. And I hope this summit helps us chart paths to resolving them. We're committed to including more input from as many people as possible. So every page of our content has a discuss function where we'd love to get your input. And we've already made changes to our topics, to our articles, based on this feedback. So what's left to do? Our work and the work of many others gives us a better understanding of the biblical foundations of work than ever before. This means there are more challenges, more work to do than ever before. I see two pressing needs. The first need is to create resources for specific occupations and situations. We need to help architects, business people, crane operators, parents, civil servants, lawyers, and every other kind of worker figure out <coughs> What specifically does God want me to do in my line of work? To produce materials like that, we've got to include people from every line of work, because only they know the real challenges and experiences in their line of work. One of the biggest challenges of the faith, faith and work movement is bringing together people with biblical and theological skills with people who have occupation-specific knowledge and experience. I hope that you will create resources for your audiences and workplaces. As I said, we had tools on our website to help you identify relevant biblical passages for specific topics in work. And we're inviting those who write applied resources to send them to us, and we'll include them on a new section of our website. And we'll gladly link to other websites as well. The second major task is to transmit these biblical, theological, practical resources to workplace Christians on a global scale. We know that people are hungry to apply the Bible to work because they're searching the internet for it. About 85% of the people who come to our website, and that's about 30,000 per month, about 85% of them come because they've done a Google or Yahoo search on a topic like the attitudes and work, or what is a Christian perspective on faith. So we know that people are out there searching for materials on the Bible and work, and we have got to connect with them. We've begun using Facebook, Twitter, and all the other social media approaches, as I know many of you have. Still, there are hundreds of millions of workplace Christians around the world, and we've got to work together to figure out how to reach and equip all of God's people in every kind of workplace all around the world. I look forward to learning what you are doing and to sharing best practices and ideas. God, by your grace, help us to figure this out together and soon. Amen. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, I was, I was really struck that made a very powerful impression on me, that young man in a gas station 
seeing evil, seeing wrong, but doing the right thing himself. And yet it's a very hard thing to confront your boss. Um, even if you have the right words, even if you know the right things to say, um, that takes a lot of courage. So I wonder if you could just say, what, what could we tell the younger generation in your, in your mind? What would you want to say to that young man about having courage, about being able to integrate his faith in his work? Well, I, I, really, I really do believe that if I'd had examples, like the example of mm -hmm. Abigail, uh, and someone to help me understand that that wasn't a story that God only did once, 3,000 years ago, but that's the way God works. There is a way to confront someone in power. It needs to be done respect, uh, politely and respectfully, uh, and it actually does work. I mean, if someone had, I guess if, if the Bible were not only a source of principles, but also a source of stories and inspirations and testimonials, that would have helped me a lot. <laughs>